sister whose husband was the owner of a beautiful motorcycle factory. The, the Nazis took, took, stole his motorcycle factory, which his father, his brother, and he owned, and which they had built up. So he had a nervous breakdown. Not everybody was strong. And the doctor said he would not, since Hitler is the cause of his nervous breakdown, he could, uh, he, he could not get well in Germany. So my sister and her, hus her sick husband decided to go to Palestine. It was not at Israel, it was mm -hmm. 1934 or 33. And, and she and her one-year-old child and uh, her husband decided to go to Palestine. It was the quickest way to leave Germany. We had started to ride to Holland, to Switzerland, to some, some countries if there would be a possibility for, for us to come, and we had only negative answers. My mother, today I think it was a great mistake she did to all of us. We, we had uh, family cons uh, council together and the word America once fell and I th uh, because my sister's husband had relatives in St. Louis. So my, my mother said, we don't go away, so don't go away from us so far. We live, we will live in garbage in the country and you and your children will come for all the holidays and be with us, all the school holidays, and stay with us. So she really didn't, well, we, we were influenced by her. We didn't think of America. Now sometimes doctors ask me, why didn't you come to America? You know, under the influence of our thinking at the time, we wanted to stay near my parents. And we always, and some of our well-meaning friends said it will not last a long time. It will blow over, it must blow over, it can't stay, but it stayed long enough. So uh, my husband said, you accompany your sister and her family to Palestine. And if you like it, uh, I can live everywhere. If you like it, we move to Palestine. So we decided on a certain date, and we lived way for good, and I with them as company and to get information to Palestine. On the trip to Palestine, our ship stopped in Athens, Greece. My sister's husband got only his exit visa from Germany with the condition that he tries on his way to Palestine in Athens to sell motorcycles of the factory that had stolen, they had stolen from him to the Greek army to do that business for, for, the, for the Nazis. So our ship, we took a ship that stopped in Piraeus, Athens, and we were met by two men in Athens at the harbor on that trip to Palestine. The one took my brother-in-law to the ministry in order to execute that order, and the other one took my sister and me and a little child sightseeing. He wanted to show us Athens. He could speak German, and so there was no difficulty commuting with him. It was May, we were on the Acropolis. It was a beautiful, beautiful May day. The, the Acropolis and Athens, everything in sunshine, blue sky, blooming, flowers blooming. And the man who was our guide asked me what's going on in Germany with this Hitler business. And I told him as much as I could and I said, I want absolutely, I have to leave Germany. And he said, come to Greece. Greeks are nice, number one. But second, I don't know what went on. Maybe he liked me or 
maybe he wanted to do something good, I don't know what, he said, come to Greece, come to us, you will have a wonderful future. The Greeks like German doctors, German doctors had a very good name at that time, even Americans and, and other doctors studied in Germany. So we like German doctors and all the people, all the wealthy people who go now to Paris or Vienna or Berlin to seek uh, medical help, they would all come to your husband. <laughs> and he talked himself and me in a beautiful uh, future in Greece. And he said, the examination, this is a question of form, this is nothing, we will arrange for that. So. I like to hear that. I like that very much. And in the evening, after a stay of eight hours, we went back to the ship and went on to Palestine. Now, I was not prepared for Palestine. Palestine was primitive, hot, sandy, brown, and I came from the most comfortable, modern, wonderful, green country. I mean, landscape wise. <laughs> and I visited a few people whom I know, knew from Germany who had already emigrated to Palestine, and some of them were doctors, and they lived in most, most uh, primitive circumstances. There was not even toilet paper, they used uh, uh, newspaper. I mean, and they cooked a family meal on a little, little burner. I mean, I was so spoiled and really, as I said, not prepared for that kind of life. People ask me, people I met, they ask me, what is your husband? I said, my husband is a doctor. They said, you should come to us. Everybody encouraged us to come to Palestine, but your husband can't live there as a doctor. The slogan at the time was, stop doctors, send patients. Mm -hmm. Your husband can be a factory worker, a taxi driver, a shepherd, he will find something to do, but not as a doctor. And I had in my ears what I heard from that Greek man, everybody will come to my, to my husband as patients, they only waited for him to come. So I sent my husband a telegram to meet me in Athens. And I, though I had another route to go home, I changed it and went back to Athens to meet, and at the same day my husband was to come from Germany. And the only person I knew in Athens was uh, that one Greek man. What was his name? Do you remember? Papa Karalampos. Papa Karalampos. I forgot his first name at the moment. Okay. So Papa Karalampos met me at a certain hotel in Athens because I arrived at 12 o'clock and my husband at noon and my husband at would come at five o'clock in the afternoon. So I spent a few hours with, with uh, Papa Karalampos. Uh, you know, we did in Europe, we, we said, Mr. Papa Karalampos, Mrs. Miller. We didn't use the first name. That was a new thing for me when I came to America. And so in, a, in, a force of, in those four we, uh, hours that I had to spend with Papa Karalampos, he told me, the first thing to learn is I love you, Saika Po in Greek, and I had a hard time to keep him away from me. Then my husband came, okay, okay, and uh, Papa Karalampos had made reservations for us in a hotel, not in the very best, which I was used to go to <laughs> in my life until then. So the next day, uh, my husband and I, we ventured to go sightseeing on our own in Athens. And we came to a building and we recognized it as being a, a hospital, a big hospital with a garden in front. And we were curious and we went through that garden towards that building, just so. And a doctor comes who works at that hospital with a whole following of young doctors, and he, uh, he comes to us, uh, towards us and asks us uh, what we want here, because we looked a little bit forlorn there. 
and I said uh, we, we, were, we were only curious, we, we must have spoken German because we didn't know Greek, but he spoke, he spoke German also. We, we were on, the, uh, we on, on our trip and we wanted to see the hospital. My husband is a doctor and we were curious. And he said, you come with me in my office. And we had a nice little visit in his office. And he said, now it's 12 o'clock. At 1 o'clock, I let you have my car and my chauffeur to drive you around sightseeing. At 1 o'clock, you pick me up and, we, and I invite you for lunch. It was wonderful. I mean, we didn't know a soul in Athens but that Papa Caralampus. By the that is telephone now. Is this a telephone? Yeah. So Papa uh yeah. Papa my son will take Just keep going. Please. Papa Caralampus, the word Papa. Many Greek names have to begin with Papa, which meant they had a papas, a priest in their family. That's the way. So we, the chauffeur drove us around, we saw as much as we could, it was wonderful to be guided through the city, and then we picked up the doctor, and we drove to the ocean. There's a long street, uh, Leophorus is a long highway from Athens to the ocean, we, and we drove along the ocean to go at a certain taverna which he had planned to take us to. And on the way, he stopped at a lovely, lovely house, which was located on the ocean, in gardens. And he said, you must meet uh, my relative. I think it was a uh, sister-in-law or somebody. And he stopped there. And we went in, the, in, the, in that villa, and there was a woman, and she was the wife of the gynecologist of the university the highest gynecologist in Athens. And she was a German woman. And actually we could talk and talk. Was she Jewish? No, no. nobody no. was Jewish. No. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, tomorrow is my husband's birthday and I'm giving a party and I invite you to that party. Now that was number two people we met. So that uh, the doctor who had taken us there, he said, I pick you up in your hotel and we go to, together to the party on the ocean. Then we went to the taverna and we had dinner, uh, lunch or late lunch, and then he brought us back to our hotel. And my husband was terribly sick. You could be, be, uh, become very sick in essence, the food, and the bacteria or whatever made you sick that it was prevalent, is that the word? Prevalent, yeah. Prevalent. <laughs> so prevalent. the next day uh, we were picked up five o'clock in the afternoon and driven out to the beautiful villa on the ocean and there was the doctor, the, the husband of Greek of that uh, German wife that we had met the day before and several guests. And one of the guests was a doctor, Papa Marco, and he had also a German wife and a German Jewish wife. So we, we, it was a very nice company. Two wives spoke were German, and so I could speak, and, uh, and, and the others were doctors, so my husband had a very good uh, time speaking so, to them. So. So you decided to move to Athens, is that...? Uh, uh, not yet. Not we were, it was the second day only. But we had... But one woman, Mrs. Papa Banku, the, the German Jewish wife of the Greek doctor, prominent Greek doctor, she lives in New York now and is one of my very best friends. And we have so many memories together. Her husband died, and unfortunately she lost her daughter of cancer, but she has two more children, and she lives here, and she's about 95 years old, mm. and, well, and well. But then another story happened. We met, yeah, Dr. Lobo the Topolos, the, the gynecologist of the university, said, come to to my to the university, and I want to show you the university hospital. 
It was naturally very interesting. And the next day, next day we visited him and he showed us around in the hospital. And he had his, uh, his assistant doctor as a guide for us. And the assistant doctor had just come from Germany where he had studied gynecology and spoke very well German. So he showed us around and then he had a plan, this doctor. And, he, and we said we would like to come to Greece and he said we will arrange something. You bring the equipment of a hospital to Athens and we will open a hospital together, the Greek doctor and my husband, and while you study for your examination, you can work under me and uh, until you are ready with the language and so, uh, to take the examination. So you come and you have an income from the first day you unpack your, your hospital equipment. So then we left. I mean, we were very, I left Greece and went home. We were very happy. Our future was already planned. So my husband had to close his office and we had to ask for the permission to buy the equipment of a hospital. And we got the permission from the German government and the logic is a little strange. They said, there is no German hospital in Greece. You know, there were Italian hospital, a French hospital, a Swiss hospital, but not a German hospital. And it would help the German prestige if your husband, or if Dr. Müller, would open a hospital. So they said, you can use the money you own uh, to buy the equipment for a hospital. First, we had to pay Reichsflugsteuer. This is the tax when you leave, for the Jews, when you leave the country, you have to pay tax ahead for, I have forgotten, for 10 years, for a long time. It was a lot of money. It was maybe a quarter of what we owned, mm -hmm. a quarter of the money we owned. We had to put down for the German state that they didn't lose that income. And then, then they closed our account. They said that there was so and so much left. For so and so much, uh, you can buy the equipment and send it to Greece. Naturally, we had to buy it in Germany. That the German merchant made the deal. And this is it. Even in the Baedeker, Baedeker is a travel book in German was written, was for a long time written, German Hospital, Dr. Ernst Müller. They threw us out as Jews, and, uh, and this is was the story that happened to us. So in about two weeks, during about two weeks, we spent all the money that we had, for which my husband worked for so many years, and my father probably gave me as a dowry. We spent it, one, two, three, on beds, on linens, on kitchen equipment, on x-ray equipment, on diatomy apparatus and everything, instruments you need for a small, complete hospital. And we put it in, uh, it was sent into lift vans, big lift vans, and sent off out of Germany. And your parents and your sister stayed in Germany? My sister was, was already in Palestine. In Palestine not very happy because her husband was uh, uh, very, his nervous, had the nervous breakdown and didn't, had not recovered at that time. And my parents had moved to Garmisch. Okay. Now what comes next? Yeah. Then, interview with Mrs. Lieselot Kahn. So, we went home home was then still Nuremberg and prepared all the things for our move to Greece. And when we had everything closed up, no money anymore, no practice anymore, came a postcard from that Greek doctor written in pencil. He had told about his plans to other doctors and the other doctors discouraged him and advised him not to open 
uh, hospital with a formula. So the deal is out. Now, for the first time, my courageous husband uh, nearly broke down and for 24 hours he didn't leave his bed. He said, I can't anymore. He has given up everything in Germany and no future. And that time I was courageous and I said, I go with you. We plan first that he goes ahead and I come later when, every, when he's a little bit installed. I go with you and we will make it. Once he was uh, brave and once I was brave. So we went together to Greece and we stayed in a furnished home in a terrible neighborhood near the uh, near the market. It was hot and we had no money. We ate every day just a tomato and a piece of bread and Mr. Papa Haralamus provided us with a Greek teacher. This Greek teacher was the nicest person and became my best friend. She was a fine professor and she, she didn't speak German but she spoke a little French and she taught my husband. And my husband studied with her for 10 months. And after 10 months he spoke fluently Greek and not only did he speak the language, he had read in those 10 months the book for every book for every kind of medicine, pediatrics, orthopedics, eye, uh, eye doctor, uh, ear doctor, uh, foot doctor. He had read all the specialties in Greek in three months, in, in ten, 10 months. Then we naturally asked to become Greek citizens because my husband was only allowed to take the medical examination as a Greek. Foreigners couldn't do that. So the uh, law was you could take the examination, uh, you could become a Greek citizen if and when the minister president gives you the permission. It was good and not good. Here you have to wait five years. But there, the, pres uh, uh, the minister president could give you the citizenship whenever you wanted, or he couldn't, not at all, give it to you. So it was good or not good. So after 10 months, with the help of a Greek lawyer, whom we didn't pay much because we had not much money, and with whom we could not speak, but Karalampos always uh, managed that. Uh, after 10 months, we became citizens. You had to be political, uh, uh, how shall I say, pure, <laughs> not to be a communist. So after 10 months, we were Greeks. And people who wanted after us wanted to, there came a flow of refugees later from the north, Belgium, the north, from Holland, and from Germany. They, they didn't get the citizenship anymore because uh, we were the the first one and the last one, I guess. And as soon as my husband had uh, had the citizenship, he could apply for the medical examination. But before, you know, during those three, uh, during those ten months, he couldn't leave the country, but I could. I was homesick for the children and for for everything. And after three months, I had the nervous breakdown and uh, uh, flew back to Germany to see my children. My children, I left with my parents in Garmisch, and they had enough to eat and they had a place to stay. And then I, I stayed in Germany and I thought, as long as I'm in Germany, my parents can take care of me, my husband wouldn't pay take care of me and the children. And every day that I'm uh, there, it costs nothing to my husband. And so I was there for about uh, a few months. What was it like there? 
uh, well, I lived in the country and had no contact with anybody anymore. So you had no idea what was going on in the Oh, yes, I you had did. ideas. I mean, people talked, you heard radio, there were speeches by Hitler. I never, never could understand what Hitler really said. For me, it was only a geschrei, geschrei with loud, loud words. Words, 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 and I could never, I had not one, uh, once a, a good speech for my taste, heard that was a good speech. So I was in the country, my parents were on a trip, and on a Saturday at about noon, my doorbell rang, and there was a, a policeman. And we were always scared, always scared when the doorbell rang. And I asked what, the, uh, what he wants. And he said, I, I'm sent from the, from the mayor or from the government to ask the address of your husband. I said, who wants the address and why do you want the address? Where is your husband? He said, I said, well, I will not tell it to you, but I tell it to the government, to the, uh, whoever is in charge of those questions. He said, take your bicycle and we drive, we bicycle over to the government building in Garmisch. And we came and arrived at the government building five minutes after 12. And at 12, Saturday, the building was closed. Everybody was. So I said, all right, and I come back on Monday. But between Saturday and Monday, I did some thinking. And I said, if my husband could not come back, I didn't know why he should come back. That would be the end of his. If he didn't come back, they would take away my passport. And I could not go to him. So that was the situation. I thought very quickly. I took the train on this Saturday to Munich. Munich was a, it was a big city an hour away. I got, a t I got tickets for, for going to Switzerland, to Zurich for the children, I got them some warm coats. I got, I don't think I got anything, a, a few clothes for the children, and came home and took, that was Saturday night, I took the Sunday, where everything in Germany at the time was closed, to pack my things, take a sentimental walk to a mountain, and between Sunday night and Monday, morning at about two o'clock at night, it was December and pitch dark, I went uh, to the train and uh, went first from Garmisch to Munich and then to, to the Bodensee, the big lake which is the frontier between, between Switzerland and Germany, went on a boat and off I went and was in Switzerland and there I could breathe again. Now there were many problems, I had no money. I always had no money. So in Switzerland, in Zurich was a pension, a little, little hotel. And the owner of that pension was a friend of, a school friend of my mother's. So I knew her name and her address and went with my children there. And she was very nice and helpful. She said, you don't have to pay. I told her I couldn't pay. I know your mother will pay later and you can stay until your ship goes. My ship only went uh, 10 days later, so I stayed with the children in Zurich without money, but she, she helped me, and then came the time that I could uh, travel to Italy and brought the ship to Palestine, I know, to Greece, to Greece. And I came in, in, in winter, and we took a room in a, they saw a place on the ocean. It was icy cold. They had no heat. The floors were stone. They had nothing to eat. My husband lost 20 pounds, but not being on a diet, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but having no money. So my husband studied. I studied too, but not with a deadline. What were you studying? Greek. 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 And French. I mean, I had French in school, and I, but I had no facility of speaking, really. English? Did you study English at all? 
Uh, well, yeah. we didn't need any of that. Right. Yeah. And then came the day where my husband had to take the examination. And that's the examination is another story. He was very much afraid of the surgeon who, ex uh, who took his examination. He was such a nationalist, and I said, only when you, the, the, the doctors have decided. My husband would be a good doctor, they wouldn't doubt that. But if he makes a, a, a mistake in speaking, then they would, uh, would uh, plunk him, because misunderstandings uh, could arise between the patients. So, um, the, the, we were very much afraid of the surgeon's examination. The evening before the examination, my husband visited the surgeon to introduce himself, and we talked and talked about medical problems and things, and my husband came home and said, tomorrow at 8 o'clock, I have the examinations with this doctor. Doctor was Dr. Mermingas. He later, under the Nazis, uh, became the mayor of Athens, but he killed himself then, under the Nazis. So the uh, next day, I went with my husband. We lived in a little house that belonged to the gynecologist, and we uh, drove 16, not miles, kilometer to Athens, to the university where my husband was to take the examination. I waited in the waiting room. My husband came back after five minutes, and I said, well, what, what happened to the examination? And he said, the doctor said, you passed your examinations already yesterday, when they talked. He, the doctor was in first yeah. while he spoke, and they talked about cases, and so that was done. Then another examination by the internist was in the big auditorium of the university. Uh, uh, the auditorium was filled with other doctors. It was exactly the same examination that all the Greek doctors, young ones, had to pass. Then when my husband's uh, uh, time came, they rolled in a patient on a stretcher, and my husband should diagnose the disease that that patient had. My husband uh, examined the patient and said to the professor, She's, she has nothing, she has nothing. And the doctor said, she has, I forgot the name of the uh, disease, this is such a clear diagnosis and you are going to be a doctor and don't see that she has a disease. My husband was angry and examined her again and said, no, she hasn't that disease, she, she, she doesn't have that disease. And then the doctor found out that the nurses have wheeled in a wrong person, a wrong patient who had really nothing apparently, and not the case that the doctor ordered. <laughs> so later the doctor brought his whole family, his wife, his daughters, his sisters, his patients to my husband. And I still have a beautiful silver bowl he gave my husband for his services. This is a little story about the examination. As soon as the examinations were passed, my husband needed the license to. The equipment of the hospital was still in a neutral port in Amsterdam, in Holland, because we didn't know if we would be Greeks and if we would pass the examination. Maybe we would have to go on to Palestine or another country. So but as soon, uh, well, as he had passed the examination, we had our things brought to, brought to Athens. In the meantime, we became close friends with Dr. Papa Marco, who had a German Jewish wife, and he helped us find a house, a private house in a, in a midtown, very good quartier, and it was empty, it was an embassy before, or something like that, a big house. And we rented it, and our lift vans came, and we unpacked it, and we had a jewel of a 
little hospital there. But no patients. We hardly have the money for pay the rent for one or two months without patients. Who knows Dr. Miller? And the first patient was very nice. The first patient was a French woman. I told you the first time when we were in Essence, we were in that second best hotel. Mm -hmm. And a woman was brought in who came from Egypt, a, a, a lawyer and his wife, and the woman was very sick. And uh, she didn't want a Greek doctor or I don't know what, but the manager of the hotel remembered that there was a German doctor and remembered the name and found out the address and she agreed to see the German doctor. Now, she was brought in our hospital and it was, and she had to be operated on immediately. It was a very complicated tumor and it was a question of life and death and quick. So, that was the first operation. This French woman, my husband had a new assistant, a new nurse, and, and they operated on that woman, and she, she became well and was fine. But she used our hospital as a hotel. And since we had no other patients, that she could stay there as a, uh, like in a hotel. And the whole French colony came to visit her, the, the French ambassador and the French consul and so. And from that moment on, my husband was had French patients right away. And then it went very, very quickly. And how long did you live in Greece? We lived in Greece for, uh, from 34 to uh, 41. How long is that? Uh, seven years. For seven years. And uh, the patients became friends. We were invited everywhere. And uh, yeah, we had a fabulous social life from, from the richest and most famous people to poor people who came on the back of donkeys from the country and from the islands to see my husband. He was a wonderful doctor. And, uh, but it helped him for the people at, in the beginning that he was a German doctor. Was the fact that he was Jewish a problem at all? No. Nothing. I mean, people with whom we socially got together, we told them that we were German. One day, there was, a, there was a big German colony in Athens. They came too, in spite of Hitler. And a pastor came, you know, and visited us. And he was a very nice man who came and we talked. And he was just to go for his vacation, it was summer, to Germany. And he has, we have never heard a word, nobody had heard a word from him. He was killed by the Nazis because he was a, a decent man and visited Jews, refugees. My husband helped the British a lot. He made a, a, a very important a war invention for the Navy. He gave that invention to the Greek navies, naturally, and the Greek navies gave him permission to give it to the British Navy. The British Navy was much more important than the Greek Navy. And so we were very good friends. The British wanted to pay us for it, but my husband didn't accept any pay. What, what was it, the invention, do you remember? It was it's very difficult. I don't know if I can can uh, explain it right. Uh, the ships had a protection, a kind of wire around the whole mm -hmm. hulk or bulk, <laughs> and uh, that mines, sea mines, could not destroy them. Those wire contraption kept the sea mines. Uh, meant that uh, they couldn't go through that wire. Okay. And my husband made an invention that the mines could go through, cut through the protective wire. And, and uh, but I, I really don't know exactly how it was. Okay. Anyhow, it was used by the British and it was uh, and they were grateful to him. And all, the British were also patients as, as uh, employees of all the embassies. 
the Italians and the Germans. And, and, so, and then uh, we had a very nice life. I complained some by, sometimes about the heat, and I thought it must be nice in America, but there was really no, uh, no reason we had an income. My husband had a, a good practice and a good name, and we had a good social life. I met the king of Greece, I was invited, and I was invited by the queen of Greece, later Friederike, who was a German. But what about your family back in, in Germany and your husband's family? Oh, that is another story. In 1935, we were one year out of Germany. We, read my, we met my sister and I and the children met my parents in Switzerland. At that time, my parents could take enough money out of Switzerland to pay for, uh, for a hotel in Switzerland and to send us tickets. This was all paid in Germany, so the Germans uh, naturally uh, got the money. And it was 1935, and we were sitting there in a hotel. And my sister and I said we would never go back to Germany. I said, as long as Hitler said, I never went back anyhow, ever. And my sister doesn't want to go back either. So, so I said to my parents, we didn't know yet about all the killing in the concentration camps. It was 35, the beginning. And so I said to my parents, if you don't go out, of Germany, we will never see you, and that they couldn't, uh, they couldn't uh, have. So we sat next to my mother in a hotel in, in Switzerland and kept her, because if she had gone back to Germany, she would, in her nice house and surroundings, she would have closed maybe her eyes and ears to what was going on. Mm -hmm. She was very uh, schwerfällig, which means she didn't want to move, you know. And my father said, I have to go once more to Germany for some uh, things to take care of. I promise you I come back in three days. We were very much afraid and we had a very bad time at the frontier. They searched him bodily, but he, after three days he came out of Germany and they, uh, he made an arrangement. He got his uh, pension from the bank sent to Palestine. My parents had to decide either to come to Greece to me or to Palestine to my sister, and they decided to go to Palestine because uh, they felt, uh, uh, for many reasons, they are better off in Palestine than in Greece. And they went 1935 to Palestine and liked it very much, though my father was not a Zionist. At the time we were, as I told you, a German burger of Jewish religion. We were not uh, educated and brought up in the sense of Palestine. Naturally, later he was so happy in Palestine and he was all for Palestine and all of us. And I, since I'm here, I work for Technion in Israel and I just do what I can for, for Israel. And. Uh, yeah, so they went to Palestine. So they left. And w were your husband's parents in Germany at they this were, point? They, they, they were dead at the time. But for instance, my, the two brothers of my father, one was a doctor, a gynecologist, and the other was a banker, were killed by Hitler. And many of our cousins and aunts, and especially all the friends, all the young people we grew up in, were brought to concentration camps and died. We just were out with no money and many worries and many hard work and many, many, many uh, uh, bad things happening to us. But we, we were not in, in a concentration camp. My father was killed in Palestine in World War II when it started, 1940. There was a bombardment in uh, Tel Aviv. The Italians, who were uh, together with the Germans, Mussolini, flew over Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv was, had been declared an open city, and there were no air raid alarms and no shelters and nothing. 
and people, it was September and September, Palestine is as beautiful as it's here, warm and sunny, and it flew in the afternoon over Tel Aviv and just let bombs fall. And my father was killed in this bombardment. So he escaped Hitler and Germany, but he was mm -hmm. 41, killed by, by bombs. And your mother stayed? My mother stayed, she was devastated. She stayed, and then two years later she died of uh, cancer. She had cancer, she was only 60 and died in Tel Aviv. So you were in Greece for seven years, yeah. and then what, what happened after that, 41? Then uh, the World War II started, and we stayed in Greece during, uh, during the Greek Italian and German war until the last day we did what we what we could. My husband was very uh, busy uh, taking care of patients. I helped the British. I was surprised the wife of the British ambassador invited me to join her group of British women to make bandages and knit, knit and so. And uh, so we stayed in Greece. And actually, we were Greek, uh, we were Greek uh, citizens, but something in between happened. Over the years, we tr uh, tried to get some money out of Greece. It was forbidden. You could, a poor country, you could not send any money out. But we had some trusted American or other patients. And sometimes my husband said, pay pay instead of paying in Draken, Draken is money in Greece, mm -hmm. to me in Greece, pay to a, a relative of ours who was a banker in London, and we had opened an account. And so slowly, $100 or $50 or so came in, in, that, in this uh, bank account. We could do it only with people whom we trusted. So we had uh, uh, we had some money. We had maybe five thousand dollars or something like that in our British account, and we had, it was a very good uh, security for idea of security. If something happens to us, we have some money. And one day in 1900, I would say it was 1939, we got a letter from my husband's family. My husband had a married sister, the sister had three children, one of the child, children was married and uh, there were some in-laws, anyhow, and they wrote to us, the last chance to leave Germany is to go to China. There was an immigration of German Jews to Shanghai, to China, but we need money. We need the money in dollars, each, uh, uh, each uh, ticket for the ship is $300, and we have to have some, of, I don't know, or we have some $300 to show the Chinese that we are not a burden for them. We have, without that, they don't let us in. So we figured it out, and the money we had saved and hoped for to, to own, we right away from London sent to them, and they could go to China. So we saved all the relatives of my husband. I don't, I have forgotten seven or eight or how many they were. And they could enter China and they so survived and came later, much later to America. So died, so came uh, a natural death. But they came to America and they, they live in Houston and I talked to them. <laughs> so of us our money, but it was understood that we helped them. And we had many, many refugees in Greece. We certainly were not rich. My husband worked ten, uh, six years. You can, uh, you can imagine even if you have a good practice how much money is left over in six years. But all the refugees who streamed into Greece uh, uh, could come to our hospital. They knew, they talked, they, they went around like wildfire. There is one refugee who is successful. And we, they could eat in our hospital. And my husband took care of them and gave, I saw a doctor and gave them money if it was absolutely necessary. And the ones who were, let's say, with our education and, and our, uh, our kind of people, we invited in our home and had them 
stuff. Four, interview with Mrs. Lisa Lot Khan. So, World War II was lost for the Greeks. We were in our hospital when the British ambassador, the British embassy was across the street from our hospital, when he came in the hospital and said to my husband, it is 12 o'clock noon now, at 3 o'clock you have to be in Piraeus on the ship in the last convoy that leaves Athens, Greece. My husband lost his head and said, I cannot flee again, I have a penny outside. If some Greek friends might protect us and we can go underground. And the British ambassador said, if you can, cannot make up your mind yourself, I bring you on the ship by police force. And that's so what my husband up. We had paid for four tickets on that boat or ship and uh, we took the car. We had to take enough to eat for the trip and warm clothing and blankets. Though we had a cabin, a first class cabin, when we came to the ship, the captain said, don't go in your cabin, it's in front of the ship and the harbor is full of sea mines and the when we are stored, that part will be destroyed first. So we slept on the deck in, in clothes. And the sh ship zigzagged through the Mediterranean and we, had, we were every day attacked by the German Zucker and but they didn't hit us. They just missed us. Yeah. And we arrived in in Haifa after a trip of ten days. But it was one more very unpleasant adventure. When we were, came to Haifa the police, naturally, immigration and so on, came on the ship. And everybody, everybody was released. It took a whole day from morning till evening, but the family Miller. And we were nervous. Why, why were we kept and not called in for the ent entrance uh, permit? And it was like that a spy with the same name, Miller, was. Uh, 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 announced to the British uh, in Palestine that the spy would come and they thought my husband is the spy. They, there was already a lorry standing on the port to take us somewhere at a concentration camp in Palestine. But someone, a journalist, uh, convinced uh, the authorities in Palestine that we are not the spy, that he had heard about the Caesar doctor from Athens and so and so, and we were cleared. But very late at night, it was Friday night, the Jews didn't, <laughs> they didn't uh, drive taxis anymore, and so we were the last to leave that uh, boat on which we fled. And we came to my mother, and had some place to go. And one of the people we knew on the ship, we wrote a little letter to my mother that we have, she had no idea that we had left Greece. There was no communication, there was bitter war. There was a, a, the Battle of El Alamein in Egypt, the, the Rommel, the Desert Fox was winning at the time. So. And my, my, uh, a young boy rang my mother's bell at her house, at her apartment in Tel Aviv, and gave her that little, that little note. Mm -hmm. And she, she took her time to find her glasses, to read it. The boy had disappeared again. And there she read, your family is safe in Haifa. And she said her reaction was, and I haven't even given a tip to the boy who brought it. <laughs> so we went to my mother and stayed with her in Palestine for three months. We couldn't take her with us, and this is a very sad other story, which is too long now for me to tell you. And after three, 
I, I had the address of one American patient and friend, but no only one with me. Though my husband was a, a, a doctor of the whole American School of Classical uh, Studies and a counselor. And I uh, sent a cable to uh, Gladys, was her name, to Gladys find uh, the former uh, American consul in essence who was a friend, a friend of ours and whose ch a ch a child my husband brought into the world and the director of the, uh, of the archaeological school in Princeton. And those two, she found those two and those two found again uh, 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 very important people. Uh, I can't just think of the name. That's okay. Wells and, uh, uh, well, the Secretary of State in America and another one, just some of Wells and the other, whose name I, escapes me at the moment. And we got a visa to America. But it was a difficulty at the time to find a ship. But how, I don't remember, we found a ship, an Egyptian ship that went to uh, New York. And after three months, we left heartbroken my mother and went through from Jerusalem with a train through the desert to Egypt and walked through the sand of the desert until we found the ship in Ismailia. And on that ship, we traveled 70 days to America. And the 70 days were at least without worry for food. We got something to eat, bad as it was, but we got every day. We had paid naturally for the, for the uh, trip. Did, were your belongings, did you have your belongings with you? Did no, you we had a suitcase, a suitcase. I mean, the, in essence, we left the whole complete furnished house it was had beautiful paintings, beautiful furniture, books, and whatever we owned, clothes, we left there everything. And in Greece, we slowly built up again. No, we, no, in, in uh, uh, from Germany, we could take the uh, furniture to Greece, no money, but furniture. And from Greece, we left everything when we fled to Palestine. For Palestine, we had absolutely nothing. And we had $150, this was the only money we had, which a Greek, who was not even a friend, but knew who my husband was, uh, uh, a stranger, gave us, a rich man, a rich king, gave us as a gift $150. That was the money we had arrived with in, in New York. But we were very happy to be in New York, and I was always optimistic because I knew that I had such a capable husband. And here, naturally, the beginning was very, very uh, difficult. We lived in one room, furnished room, and it was bad enough. And uh, when I saw a room that cost one dollar more uh, a week, my husband said, we cannot afford that. And on Christmas, our sponsor, Professor Shear, who was a millionaire and, and a fabulous uh, archaeologist, uh, sent us a poinsettia. And the lead lady said, people like you, one doesn't send flowers, one sends something to eat. And I gave that poinsettia right away away to some of my acquaintances in New York. And the beginning was very, very difficult. But my husband had to take my husband had to take examinations again, medically, and he started from morning till night, and he was so pale, and he was so thin, and he was so warm, but he made it. He, we came in October, arrived here in October, and the language examinations was on, already finished and closed. And you had to take, as a foreigner, a fin uh, language examinations, and then the medical examination. But our sponsor, Professor Shear, called Albany, and they let still my husband take part in the language examinations. 
In the meantime, naturally, we had learned some English from the patients and studying on the trip. We studied and studied and studied. And my husband took the, the first medical examination here after our arrival that was in January, and he made it. And people said to him, you will not make it the first time, you will fail. So go to Boston and take it for Massachusetts too. Tell me what this is. This is my grandparents' house in Ulm. Ulm is a town in Württemberg and it's called Ulm under Donau. Donau was the Danube. We spent all our vacations as children in this beautiful home. It has a garden in the back. My grandparents were very interesting, educated, cultural, interested people. My grandmother was an outstanding woman. She did what now the government does. She helped set up a milk, a so she did a lot of social work and she founded it all. She founded a milk kitchen for the ch ch poor children, a soup kitchen for the poor people, a, a school for sewing for the young girls. She also founded a, a institution for women's education and women's learning. She gave stipendia, uh, stipendia every year for five students to become educated. She was the head of the Red Cross in Ulm during the World War II. She had a lot of uh, a big field to work for her social things. She was, uh, she arranged that the soldiers who passed in trains through, uh, through Ulm, that they get fed and that they get gifts and she got, uh, she had also interesting, most interesting social life since she arranged the concerts in Ulm and the literary lectures in Ulm. The performing people lived in this beautiful house. She had guest rooms and servants, and she got so much uh, orders from, uh, from the king of Württemberg, uh, once when I was, as a child, at the time I was there, she had a big party for the Queen of Württemberg, and that was uh, something for a Jewish woman, I think. Okay. About the biography that was written about my grandmother. No. I cannot say everything. Okay, no, just tell me, uh, tell me only where this is and when this was taken. That is the wedding dinner in my grandparents' house, the wedding dinner for my mother and father and little aunts and uncles who are sitting around the table in the dining room in Ulm. Let me see what you have. <laughs> that is my parents' house in which I grew up in Nuremberg. It was a beautiful home. My parents had many guests, and it has the house had a, a big yard in the back of the house. So. There's somebody in that window. Well, I think yeah. that's me or my sister. Then tell us. That are my parents when they got married, and they were both very good-looking people. My mother was very pretty and slim and elegant, and my father, as you can see, was also a handsome man, and later he had his beard taken off, and I think he looked still better without the beard. Is that enough to say? Tell me their full names, please. My father's name is Stefan Hirschmann, and my mother's name is Martha Ne Hellman. Okay. Where was this picture taken? I don't know. I was okay. born. All right. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> that is my mother with me and my sister. 
As you can see, there are little children. Which one are you? The bigger one. Okay. This was my house, Dr. Ernst Miller's house in Nuremberg, across the street from my parents' house. It was a lovely short street. Every house had gardens in the back. And uh, this is the house that we renovated inside and made it very modern for the 1930s. Less is more. And it is at the pictures of the house that I found in the New York Library after many, many years and love to look at them. This is my husband, Dr. Ernst Miller. I, he was in the army as a young doctor in World War I. I just want to see, see a young Jewish doctor who received the Iron Cross and other decorations and later was thrown out right before one could kill him in a concentration camp. Okay. okay. No, just, yeah. just. This is our country house in Garmisch-Partenkirchen. That's where my parents planned to retire after my father left his uh, position at the bank and they, he built a house in 1932 or 3 with plans that never... All right. That's my bridal picture in 1926. It was married to Ernst. That's the way we dressed at that time. It was taken in my parents' house. Okay. This is a picture that was taken when I was 27 years old. The young girl standing there has published it now in a catalog now in 1994 in a catalogue that came out for her father's exhibition in Germany. He was a painter and an architect and a very talented man. And she thought it was a nice picture. I don't understand. Who is who, is who here? Tell me all the people here. The girl, the, both girls are the daughters of Karl Grossberg. Karl Grossberg would have been 90 years, 100 years now, and a German uh, Reich uh, made an exhibition of his paintings that comes to different towns in Germany and had big success. That are his daughters, and the older daughter who became now, a few years ago, a good friend of mine wrote a beautiful introduction to that wonderful catalogue. Okay, tell me what this That's is. That's the Nuremberg Synagogue. Nuremberg had 10,000 Jews. My father played a big role in the congregation, and I was married in the synagogue. And what happened to the synagogue? The synagogue is. The yeah, other is a picture, a picture of Nuremberg, with a synagogue in the background. Hmm? Okay. This bust is made by Chu Davidson. This is my husband Eli Khan. I think it's a very good likeliness, and Eli was a fine architect who built the script building and across the street, Bergdorf Goodman and Two Park Avenue and many, many, many high-rise building, buildings in Manhattan. At the time when he practiced architecture, he built more buildings than any other architect in New York.